Hey, hey, Hanukkah, hey, puddy, Hanukkah, hey, hey, Hanukkah, hey, puddy, Monica. I'm gonna put the back of the music on, bugger it. <laughs> hey, hey, Hanukkah, hey, puddy, Hanukkah, hey, hey, Hanukkah, hey, puddy, Hanukkah. Not gonna lie, this video has been a long time in the making. I'd probably say about four months. It's been basically, I follow the library of Alan. Zandria. I, I don't think it's unfair to say that we have very different tastes in books, but when he said The Settling of Seds was his all-time favourite book, I was interested. So I was watching his non-spoiler review and he says multiple, 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 multiple times. It's so good. And on the scale that he used, he rates it superb plus, which is the equivalent of my 10 out of 10. 10. Now, this, I think this is the first time Alan rates a book superb plus. So again, my views are ready and I'm interested. So was this book so good? Now I am going to backtrack because Alan does put a caveat in that he doesn't give it the superb plus plus because he understands that this book isn't for everyone and more so that Senlin as a character and the characters surrounded really relate quite specifically to him, to him growing up, him and his career, him and his relationships. So it's a very personable book to Alan. I, on the other hand, uh, wasted two months reading this book, in my opinion, <laughs> not because it was a difficult read, not because it was a long read, not because I had prioritised any books above it, because I simply, I just simply found it really monotonous. Now, Settle in the Sense has a lot of rave reviews around it, and for me, as someone who doesn't read fantasy or its steampunk uh, amalgamation of what is Settle in the Sense, please take what I say with a pinch of salt because I, I it, it, it was a difficult ask for me to jump into this book anyway, because because I'm, I'm obviously going to come in with some expectations now. I will say the beginning really intrigued me, though. Sedlin, who's recently married to Maya, planned to have their honeymoon by going to the Tower of Babel. Sedlin, being a stuffy old man, holds on to this tour guide. Now the tour guide is basically like the gospel to him of what the Tower of Babel actually is. And he tunnel visions into this book. So whatever the book says, the tower must replicate because it was written down, it was, it was passed down to the people. Therefore, it must be true in some sense. Think of it as authoritarian, but let's not give Bancroft too much credit on that because what we're really going to focus on is that as they enter the markets outside Maya is lost and Sentlin cannot find her and he will spend the novel looking for her which is very much this this trope of like women as holy grail as this like achievable this achievable object and Bangrov does play with this in some case but to be found really clunky. I feel for Bancroft he really pigeonholes Senlin as this character who is so wholly focused on finding his wife that his naivety, his ability to trust whatever man comes upon him and, and yes this is one of the main issues is that there's no real female characters in this book. It, it, it's very male-centric. Not to say that there's any male gaze, it's just very male-centric. Though, have a look at the other book, it does feel as though women do play a major part, but I feel based on this book, it did really gear me up to want to read any more. Then in speaking to multiple market people, he goes to a notice board with this ream, absolute reams of people looking for loved ones, but he's aware that the the task of even waiting for Maya to turn up is like an impossibility, that the odds are against him. And this is where Selin ascends. He moves through the rungs of the Tower of Babel, each one being 
vaguely similar, similar. Rather than Senlin ascending as, a, as as an ascension, this 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 powerful movement, it really to, to me this felt like Senlin had to take the stairs because the elevator was broken. So he's he's he he is he's he's ascending, but it might take a while. The pace of me was off because even though every level was like a different world, was a different surrounding, was a very different atmosphere, what happens to Senlin is the same. They all the characters seem to unpick his naivety, his his stubbornness. And and Senlin for me is like an old boot. For you're fairly familiar with it and you get very comfortable with it straight away, but you're you're very much aware of like how comfortable it is. It feels as though Bancroft really sticks with this archetype and, and really, at only like a pivotal moment in the novel, like unleashes the chains, um, like all at once. I feel as though for character development, Senna doesn't really have that. He doesn't have development. He just has like a bell jar lifted from him. And you go, there you go, it's settling. And you're like, wow. The writing for me is very like perfunctory. It's very like utilitarian. Um, it's good because it wants to give you the message that Bancroft wants to give you. But once you've understood what the message is, once you've understood what he's doing, the facade of the writing like lifts. I feel as though I was just in this hamster wheel of, okay, we're gonna move up, bad stuff happens, he'll find something out. Okay, we're gonna move up, bad things happen, we're gonna find something out. Senlin is what Senlin is, and what you get is, is what is given to you. But Maya, probably the most interesting character, I never felt Bancroft was able to take from the, the third character, but to really like remove to be this like omnipotent like narrator who's really able to give you like everything that that Maya feels how she understands. So she's interesting. But the story isn't. <laughs> I didn't get on with the book. I kind of understood what was going on and just really wanted to get to the end. Like the first few pages are really interesting and understanding that the Tower of Babel isn't what Senlin believes or wants to believe that it is, is interesting. But I just wanted to get to the end and uh, the meat in the middle of this of this novel wasn't like enough for me to like get my teeth sunk into. More so by the end I was kind of just like chewing and like gnawing at the gristle and pulling apart at the sinew for, for some hope. For some hope there would be this like aha moment and I didn't get it. And equally, I feel as though I was meant to find Senlin, like, funny at times, but he's, like, infuriatingly naive. Like, you would think that after the first time someone scuppers you, that, that, that maybe all the people are going to be like that, but he just, like, hangs on to this, this thread. Like, I am a learned man. I read this. Like, I know. Like, I know what this is better than anyone who's experienced it because I've read the words itself which falls into the fact that Senlin is a head teacher. It feels like Bancroft's appearing over your shoulder being like you see what I did there like I wrote that and you go yeah I, I know like I'm reading it and again this kind of goes to the, the fact that the writing's very perfunctory it's very utilitarian it does what it does and it gives you the information very up front. There's no smoke and mirrors involved in the Tower of Babel. And due to how straight the point it is, I can see people being one way or another with this book. There's going to be no middle ground because if you're not invested from the offset, if you're not interested by the end of part one, I do not see you enjoying the rest of part two or part three because each one dragged for me. And even with a twist, it doesn't feel as though Bancroft's like pulled the carpet underneath you. It's as if he's kind of like just shifted the rug and you've got, oh, you were, oh, okay. Am I invested in this series? Absolutely no way. But I think the only thing, the, the only thing that would just tap me into the right area to pick it up book two is the fact that I've heard that women become a lot more prevalent in the second 
and the third one, but based solely on the first, based on the two months, I don't think I would. The series isn't for me. As a general message about reviewing books online, there's something that's, that's become very prevalent to me is that as soon as someone dislikes something that you like, people automatically get their backs up. People really like find a click. They find like a niche and they solely want to read that. Anything that's kind of like outside their depth, they really like put an arm's length out to. I, I know from videos that I've put up, people just aren't happy with the books that I'm reading. But I know Alan's going to click on this video as soon as it comes up because I've, I've been hinting with him uh, for the past few days that this is going to happen. But can we just give props to a man who does such fantastic reviews on fantasy that someone who won't even pick up fantasy, someone who does not like the genre, someone who generally doesn't even fit the bill of the audience he is trying to create. I've been there since he started his channel and I'm still there watching his reviews now. If he can convince me to pick up a fantasy book and read it, kudos to how he reviews because he is spec tacular. I'm gonna I'm gonna link his send in a sends review down below. Check it out, send it up, subscribe to him because he's he's great. I wish I was half the reviewer that he is. I'm really sorry, but I forgot that I didn't rank it. It's in the Testament Club, so 2 out of 10 for me. Bye!